I'm Dave Palumbo, founder of Species Nutrition. From my earliest bodybuilding days, I believed in only putting the best in my body. And that lives on in the Species Nutrition line of products. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. Hey guys, we're super excited to be here at the LA Fit Expo. It's our third year in a row. And uh, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be launching a Tasty Pastry. It's a low carb Pop Tart. It's got three to four grams of net carbs. And we love this show. This is our best place to be in LA. RX Television on RXMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as Hashtag Ask Dave. Your 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions, diet, training, supplementation, IABB pros, news, whatever is on your mind, it is all on the table. So we now bring it Dave Palumbo. Dave, obviously, it's been about three, four days now in the bodybuilding world. Still very much in shock uh, to the news that we received uh, Sunday. Throughout the course of the day, there were seemingly unverified reports but then uh, at a certain point late in the afternoon we all pretty much had a universal uh, agreement in the sense that the news is true and that john meadows um had in fact left us uh a big loss for the bodybuilding world i know that uh, you know you, you read the tributes obviously you posted a very heartfelt tribute that night uh he was someone that no one has a negative word to say about um you know universally acclaimed as a bodybuilding you know, trainer, coach, personality. Uh, but, you know, the way that we penned it and the way that I, me personally, that I will, I guess, always remember him is that he was everyone's number one fan. He seemed to be happiest for everyone, regardless of, you know, whatever realm of the bodybuilding world they were in. He was just so happy to be around everyone. You know, we used to see him at the shows and you just remember how happy he was to just talk about anything. So, Someone that certainly is going to be very much missed uh, by bodybuilding fans and everyone alike. You know, I, I think he was well liked also because he wasn't one of these guys who went around saying, you see my guy, he won or my girl, she won. You know, like he, he didn't really make himself. He didn't try to put himself out there like he was the guy who won. He was just the guy who was helping out and doing what he liked to do, you know, and, and I think that comes off as, as being very humble. Because a lot of people want to take, you know, get all the credit for their athletes winning. After all, it's the athletes that are doing the work. We're just, you know, as coaches, I'm, myself included, you know, we're just uh, guys who are, or women who are providing information and motivating our clients. And yeah, that's important. But after all, the, 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 when someone wins the Olympia, it's not about the coach. It's about, the, it's about the, the guy who won. And I think that John was all about that. He was all about promoting the athlete that he, he worked with, not about trying to get himself in there and get more people out of it. And that's because he just liked what he did. And when you like what you do, it comes off as sincere and it comes off as like um, you're having a good time. You know, it's not stressful. It's not a lot of work. And people always ask me the same question. I can only relate it to myself where people say, Dave, you're, it seems like you're always working. Do you ever sleep? I said, well, it's, I am working, but I kind of like what I'm doing. So it's not really... It's not like I really feel like I'm overwhelmed with work. And I think that's the way he was, too. He, he wanted to work in what he liked doing. And it came off as so sincere and genuine that people get attracted to that. They, they, they want to be around someone who loves the same things that they love. And that's why he had such a following. And that's why I think people are so upset when he passed. Because people just, even if they didn't really work with him, they liked his, his um, energy that he projected about the industry because it wasn't like this negative, you know, you know the people out there who are very negative about everything. It wasn't this negative projection. It was this positive like, hey, everyone can build muscle. Here's, you know, here's you know, advice on how to do it and have a good time doing it because that's what it's all about. And so he's missed, of course, because of that. Because we want to be around people. I, I enjoyed interviewing. When I interviewed him, I always, when the interview was over, I, I was in a good mood, you know. I felt like we had a lot in common and that, you know, I could sense his genuine, like, he had like this childlike giddiness about working out and, and quantifying things and figuring out new ways to achieve different results. And But, you know, at the end of the day, we never know when our time clock is up. And his alarm went off and, and they took him to a better place at this point. 
And so we have to look at it as not as a sad loss, but as, hey, we were lucky to have this guy in our lives for as long as we did. And his body of work will never disappear. It's out there still. Um, obviously, it's a big loss to his family, uh, his wife and his kids. But, uh, and that's something that, you know, uh, there's nothing we can say to make them feel any different. Time will have to heal that wound. But obviously, we can support them. I think there is a GoFundMe campaign if Tyler yes. could find it. We could put that GoFundMe campaign up there so people want to contribute to help with the uh, the costs of everything now that he's not here anymore. Uh, I'm sure his family would be greatly appreciative. And once again, I, I send my love and prayers out to uh, to everyone who, who was touched by John at some point in their life. Yeah, as for the GoFundMe, we did post it on our Instagram a couple wow, of days ago. Wow, $190,000, John. It's yeah, up to. incredible. So we will have that link in the article description below. So again, we send our warmest, warmest uh, wishes. And Someone contributed $10,000 a couple times there, I think, too. Looks like yeah, two, no, two I mean, it just it's, wow. That yeah. when someone when someone likes you when you're that loved in, in the industry and people are you know are that generous you know with their money because you've touched them in such a way that that's a special that's a special person. I mean, it just goes to show you the kind of man that he was and the kind of love um, outpouring of love that this yeah. industry uh, has given his way. So again, if you have not already contributed to that GoFundMe, we're going to put the link below um, and you'll have every chance to. Uh, assist John's family during this very, very difficult time. Let's get to the questions. Of course, the first two questions are from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Uh, Dave, after I recently re reviewed all your Ask Dave videos, I found a theory that most of your recommended food supplements such as macadamia oil, avocado oil, arachidonic acid are basically infant supplementary or additive of baby complementary foods. <laughs> uh, is this theory that something can be applied to bodybuilders daily basis? Uh, so then he goes on to say, ask something yeah. else. So I don't know if, uh, do you, do you make sense of that kind of a theory? Well, or? think about what's the, what's the population? I mean, I didn't, you know, I, I, I obviously I've, made, I've been aware of that, of that obviously compliment or that similarity, but there's a reason what, you know, babies grow, their main goal is to sleep and grow, right? And they sleep and grow because of what's going on in their body. Hormones are being produced, Right which is making their bodies, you know, change very rapidly. And they need a tremendous amount of nutrients for this. And that's why they must, that's why they have, they drink, you know, basically protein drinks, which is what, you know, people, people think that, you know, breast milk is low in protein, but it's really not when you think about it, because if you get a gram or two of protein at every dose, okay, throughout the day, and the baby only weighs seven pounds, you know, the baby's drinking eight or nine, 10 times a day. So that's, that's a gram per pound that it weighs. So that's perfect. So babies need high protein, good essential fatty acids for brain development and muscle development. And, 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 and they need calcium for bone you know, strengthening. So it's basically like a little baby is like a little microcosm of the bodybuilding world. And so if you want to be a great bodybuilder, you need to consume a lot of protein, okay? At least a gram per pound that you weigh. You need to consume a lot of essential fatty acids, okay? Because we know they're not only are they integral for nerve development, but also all the muscle cell membranes are made of these, all the hormones and prostaglandins are produced from these. So you need your, you know, your fish oils or your, you know, DHA is what they supplement babies with, um, which is a, which is one of the intermediates found in fish oil. Arachidonic acid, which is an essential omega-6 fatty acid. Uh, like you said, the poly, the monounsaturated fats, they're all in there because those are, those are what the body needs. And then what do the babies do all day? They sleep all day. So. The more you sleep as a bodybuilder, that's when your body is growing and recovering from your workout. So it, it does, it, 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 babies mimic the adult situation so greatly that it, it, it's, it's no coincidence. And once again, what's the best way to grow? Eat small meals throughout the day, just like babies do. And so I think that it's not a coincidence. And what I do recommend is, is ironic, but it's at the same time very consistent with what you would think. Um, a lot of people don't eat enough essential fats, and I've been explaining that over and over and over again, that you need these things, okay, to maximize your body's ability to build and repair muscle. Think about it. You could eat half as much protein, you know, as you do, and you'll still grow, but you won't grow as much. Same thing with fats. You can leave out all the fats in your diet. There's indirect sources of fat within the protein sources you eat, like chicken and meat and stuff like that, and fish, but it's not a lot, so you'll still grow, but you might be limiting your body's ability to put on maximum size and recover as quickly as possible 
because you're not getting enough fat or you're not getting enough protein or you're not getting enough sleep or you're overtraining your body. And that's why some people make very good you know, progress and some people make so-so progress. I you know, prided myself on maximizing my body's ability to grow okay, by doing every, covering every variable possible. Uh, and during a five or seven year period, I put on you know, 110 or 120 pounds of muscle, not of just body weight, of muscle. So to do that, you have to really maximize everything you do. And that's why I sit here and I, and I, and I week after week after week, I instruct people on what to do. You don't have to listen to me. You can get mediocre results if you want. But I'm telling you, if you follow the, the, the tenets of the science that we're discussing here and uh, of, of the basic principles of nutrition, if you, you're going to put on really good amounts of size and or burn fat depending on what your goal is. It's pure science. And then you have to go out and apply it, obviously. I can't go to the gym with you and make you bench press and uh, you know, put full range of motion and lifting heavy weights. Assuming you're doing that, though, you got to do the, the supplementation and you got to do the food. That, that's part of the whole equation. Second question again from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Dave, with your rotational diet, two days, no carbs, one day carbs, um, you never go into ketosis? You know, it's, it's questionable. I mean, theoretically, to get into ketosis, you really need to restrict carbohydrates for three days, okay? But some people can go into ketosis eating a little bit of carbs because their metabolisms are so fast that they metabolize the, whatever they're consuming carbohydrate-wise. And um, so a lot of guys will be in ketosis. And you could tell when you're in ketosis because your brain really feels very um, clear. You feel clear-headed and you feel like you have a lot of like mental energy. That's the best way I can describe it. Uh, when I do the rotation diet and I get to like two or three days of protein fat in a row and then one day of like carbohydrates, you know, that's when people tend to be in ketosis. And then they'll come out for like one day when they're on the carbs and they go back into ketosis. When kind of like when you're doing more, when you're doing like, when I have people doing like three carb days in a row and only one protein and fat day that's very low in carbs, a lot, you, more than likely you're not in ketosis on those days. But I felt it with my body, I could literally have probably 80 or 90 grams of carbs per day. For, and I'm talking carbs from like a little bit of rice or a little bit of potato and I'd still be in ketosis. I knew it, I could feel it. And as soon as I would go over the edge, like over 90, I, would, I, would, I could tell now my brain was looking for glucose and I was always hungry and I was getting those cravings and low blood sugars and stuff like that. So you gotta figure out what works for your body. But I had a very fast metabolism. So for people with slow metabolisms, you, you can't give them any starchy carbs. They just, they will not stay in ketosis. So, but, it, but once again, you don't have to be in ketosis to lose weight. You could be on a low carb diet and lose weight too. As long as you're getting your essential fats in that your body requires, you don't necessarily have to be in ketosis. It's just more comfortable to be in ketosis because your brain has an unlimited fuel source in, in the source in the way of fats. Let's go to our Instagram questions. Again, if you're not already following us, our handle is official underscore RX muscle. If you're watching us for the first time on YouTube, hit the subscribe button below, hit the notification bell. You're not going to miss any of our shows, segments, or updates. If you like what you're watching, hit the like button, comment below. That helps. And as always, we thank you for all your support. Let's go to Diesel D23. Um, gear wise, what would you say someone is running in classic versus open? So I guess if you want to alter that to how much? You know, I, I hate to say this because it's 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 not really a big a great data set that I have here. <laughs> but I, I really I've seen you know I work with people and I see what some of these get. A lot of these these cycles are exactly the same for the classic and the open guys. I mean, let's face it, classic guys are just smaller guys than the open guys. You know, there are some classic guys that can get bigger and do keep themselves smaller, and they might take a little bit less gear because they, they already got all the muscle they need. But for most of the classic guys that are still trying to add muscle and improve the way their physique looks, they're using cycles that are very comparable to the open guys. Maybe not the extreme open guys that are doing ridiculous amounts, but I'm talking for, for a, a guy who's in the open class who doesn't overdo his gear. I think the classic and the, and the open uh, cycle amounts are about the same, I would say. Now, having said that, there's always the one person that doesn't fit that mold. And I'm sure there's, there's guys in men's physique that probably use more than some of the open guys do. But that's, that's just, you know, that's, that's life. Some people are just extremists. But I don't think the cycles are that much different. I got news for you. I, got, I see bikini girls that are using more gear than the women bodybuilders are using. I don't know why, but they, but they do it. It happens all the time. So you got to find out what works for you and, and don't worry about what anyone else is doing. Let's go to action figure 86. If you eat too much carbs, you spill over and it gets stored as body fat. 
too much protein gets converted into glucose. What happens when you eat too much fat? Well, I mean, I guess you get simplistically speaking, if you eat too much protein, a lot of it, get, believe it or not, a lot of it gets metabolized directly as fuel uh, rather than getting converted right to carbs. Um, some of it is converted to carbs, but a small amount of it gets converted to carbs. Um, that's why it's hard to get fat from eating too much protein. You could, you could stall your diet and not lose any more weight because now your body is using the protein for fuel, but very, very, it, it's very, you have to eat a lot of extra protein to actually store that stuff as fat. Um, obviously, if you eat extra carbs, it's easy to get fat. And um, as far as um, fats go, fats can get stored directly as fat. They don't require insulin. So if you overeat fat, you will store the extra as fat. I mean, uh, there's, it's just, it, fat is not something people eat so much of because it, it makes you nauseous if you eat too much of it. So you don't really see people eating a whole stick of butter, right? I mean, it's just not something you do. So more than likely, you're not getting fat from overeating fat. Now, I know girls and probably a few guys out there who can, who can eat a whole jar of peanut butter. The problem with peanut butter is it's, that it's not all fat. It's, it's got a lot of carbs and protein in it. So it's, it's the carb component that you're, that you're getting fat from, really not the fat component. Now, I mean, when was the last time you saw someone take a bottle of my macadamia oil and just start chugging it down like while they're watching TV? You don't do that. You, you, you'll be sick to your stomach. So I don't really see the overconsumption of fats as much as I do foods that have fats in them. Like I said, people will overconsume nuts or peanut butter. Very rarely have I seen anyone sit and eat five avocados because it's just, you'd, you'd get nauseous. You wouldn't do it. So, um, like I said, but if you do eat extra fat, it can be stored as fat. I'll tell you where people make a mistake with fat. A lot of times when they're cooking their foods, they're pouring, they're doing that pan spray or they're putting oil in the bottom of the pan and then the food that they're eating is absorbing that oil and then they're, so they're over consuming fat and that a lot of times sabotages their diet. So if that's, if you fit in that category, I recommend that you, you poach your foods or you grill them so you don't have to put all that extra oil in the pan because the food does absorb it. Go to Caustic Demir. Did you ever do mini cuts when bulking for better insulin sensitivity? How many kcal should you reduce for how long, et cetera? I, I don't think they could have thrown an, an extra initial into that whole thing again. What you got to repeat it again between slin and kcal's and uh, <laughs> about again, mini the, cuts. <laughs> what was the question? This, the first part of the question is: Did you ever do mini cuts while bulking for better insulin sensitivity? Okay. Um, I didn't do that. I'll tell you why. Because I really never got fat in the off season. But I, I do work with people that we're bulking them up, and they get to a point, and I think they get a little too sloppy. And I, I'll, I'll throw some cardio in there. I'll cut their carbs back a little bit. I don't really put them on a diet per se, but I'll change things around to lean them out a little bit, and then I'll start going again forward. So yeah, that, I mean, that, there's nothing wrong with doing that. I think that's if the person tends to get fat, rather than turn to a you know have fat hanging off their waist. It's a good time. It's a good time. Times it's a good, uh, a good thing to do is to bring them back a little bit. I wouldn't put them on clenbuterol or fat burners though. I would just cut back their food a little bit. Um, so yesterday we had uh, Carafaggio on the show, of course, two twelve winner at the Tampa Pro. Nico Cantemir wants to know when you prepped him, uh, did you apply your keto diet, your rotational diet? If you want to maybe give us a glimpse as far as how you uh, went yeah. into for uh, Carrot. Carrot has a very fast metabolism, so. Most of the diet he was eating, you know, I was doing a rotation type thing. He was eating like a lot of days of carbs and then some days of protein and fat um, just to kind of like shock his body every third day or so or every fourth day or so. And then when we got closer, you know, um, he, I, I kept kind of the same format, but I cut back the carb amounts in the carb days, if that makes sense, because he does have a very fast metabolism. So as long as his weight was coming down, which was doing consistently and very easily, his weight, he loses weight, you know, at a good pace once I, I died him. Um, there was no really reason to really turn the screw. Now, between Chicago and Tampa, I felt that, you know, we had to bring a better look to the stage. I knew it was going to be competitive. I knew it was going to be a lot of the same guys. I knew that it was going to be determined on who was the leanest guy on stage. So I, I, I did torture him for those, those that 10 days or so. And we went protein and vegetables. We, we went like no carbs and, and very little fat for like three or four days in a row. And that three or four days, he, he lost like, you know, five or six pounds. I'm sure some of it was water, but he really leaned out a lot and it brought his glutes and hamstrings in way better than they were for Chicago. And I really believe that's what pushed him over the edge. But once again, you're talking about a guy who's a really, really genetically gifted guy in, in, in the metabolism category. I've never seen the guy fat. 
you know, he was telling us in the interview that he was drinking, you know, he, when he was really depressed and he wasn't working out because the gyms were closed, he was drinking beers on the weekend. When he came back and said, I'm ready to start again, he didn't even look bad. He might have lost a little bit of muscle just because he was kind of wasn't lifting weights, but he really, his body fat was not high. I mean, it was, it was higher than it was for the show, but it was not high. So that just tells me the guy has got a gifted metabolism. So it's, he's not a good guy to kind of emulate unless your metabolism is similar to his. Uh, Relentless Lucas, um, he wants to know as far as, uh, is it good to take a pump product before stepping on stage? I guess what would generally be your advice as far as timing mechanism for using a pump product? Yeah. You know, a lot of people have asked me this question. I know some people that actually do it. Not a lot of people. I think it's risky. I'll tell you why. Because if you look great backstage, okay, you're not being judged on veins. Because if, if, if there was a contest on who has the best veins on stage, I would be Mr. Olympia. No one had better veins than I did, okay? Crazy cord-like veins. They don't care about that. They can't, what the judges care about is muscle separation. How the muscles look, how they're stretching the skin, which is fullness, and then how they separate, meaning the grooves that they create. So when you're looking on stage and people flex their muscles, you see lines. That's what the judges are looking for. They don't care if you're pumped out of your mind. Matter of fact, having a lot of veins sometimes is a little distracting, you know, on a physique. And if you blow those veins out too much, a lot of times they can bring water to the surface a little bit. And so I think the pump products are dangerous because they do they dilate the veins, but they're not, and they do bring a little bit more muscle and in, uh, blood into the muscle, but they're really not improving separation. And in, in, in essence, if you ever did a crazy set of squats in the gym, and your legs look enormous and they're all veiny, they don't have a lot of separation because there's a lot of fluid in there from all that, you know, that pump aspect that's going on, all that blood going in there because the blood can leave the vessels and go under the skin a little bit. So I would say do not take a pump product prior to getting on stage. I think it's, it's risky. And like I said, if you're in shape and you look great, don't play these kooky games the last minute because you know what? All you can do is screw yourself up. Interesting one here is from uh, Akshay Pandey, uh, and the reason that I bring this up, uh, you do have a lot of bodybuilders now who, when, and I, like I know specifically you had the conversation with Hunter Labrada regarding his prep um, and his take on vegetables. Uh, you have a lot of bodybuilders who try to get their nutrients in other ways other than having vegetables. So yeah. uh, the question is, is it really important to eat vegetables? Vegetables make me bloat. Is it possible to take fiber and micronutrients from supplements and completely avoid vegetables? Yeah. It's a good question. And I, and I have a really good answer for that. I never give my clients vegetables. I never ate vegetables for the reason of getting nutrients. Okay, Because most vegetables are devoid of nutrients. And for most of the vegetables that we eat as bodybuilders pre-contest, it's like green beans and asparagus and you know lettuce and stuff. There's really not a lot of nutrients in that. We're doing it to keep our, our stomachs full, basically. We're trying to bulk up our diet a little bit so that we're not starving to death and giving our body a little bit of energy to use. Um, that's really what it's being used for, okay? Most of the micronutrients that you need, vitamins, minerals, trace metals, that's gonna come from supplementation. There's not a lot in foods anymore, okay? It's very hard to get enough and figure out how, uh, how am I gonna get this many milligrams of this, and this many micrograms of that, and this many units of this. It's not even worth it. Just take a supplementation like V-Mineralize. Got all your vitamins and minerals covered. You to take an essential fatty acid supplement like Omegalyze, and then you don't have to worry about the micronutrients and all the essentials. You got them in there already. The food, okay, the macronutrients that we eat, that's the food, uh, protein, fat, carbs. That's gonna help build, repair muscle, provide a fuel source, right? That's what you need that for. That's the most important thing. So when we're eating, especially pre-contest, we're really focused on getting enough protein, fat, and carbs in. Depending, each person has a different a required amount that they need. That's the most important thing. If you try to do everything and get everything into your diet, you accomplish nothing, trust me. So can you skip vegetables altogether? Absolutely, it probably doesn't even matter. I think a lot, there was a lot of you know, diets that I ate off season where I never even ate a single vegetable. I happen to like the taste of vegetables, but if I felt that it was inhibiting my ability to get enough of the good stuff in that was gonna help me build and repair muscle, I just skipped it. In other words, if I'm gonna sit and eat a meal, and, and if I know if I have a salad with this meal, I'm not gonna be able to eat as much protein as I need to eat because I need to eat 10 ounces at a, at a, at a meal, I'm not eating the, the salad. The salad's not helping me. It's not doing anything. Just because it's green doesn't mean it's doing anything, okay? That's, you know, that's, you know, foolish thinking. But 
if I know that I need so many milligrams of, of vitamin C and vitamin E and, and B vitamins to metabolize, you know, carbohydrates, help me with those reactions, I'm going to make sure I take a damn good multivitamin, multimineral to get enough calcium, magnesium, you know, iodine, you know, chromium, all those things, because I know that those, those micronutrients assist all the chemical reactions in the body. So don't worry about getting micronutrients from foods, get it from supplements. Okay, take your fiber supplement like Fiber Lies to make sure you got enough fiber in your diet so you don't have to bulk up your meals with a ton of vegetables and, and you know, carbohydrate laden foods like you know, oat bran. And then just worry about eating your meals to get your protein, fat, and carbs. Time for a couple more questions. Let's go to Big Daddy Jenks. Are there any areas of diet and training where you would say the quote meathead in bodybuilding community is ahead of the science and accepted research? I think we've been. I think the bodybuilding world's been ahead for forever, and it will always continue to be ahead because you know what? There's always going to be these uh, scientists that will do these isolated, you know, experiments showing that oh, if you do, uh, if you do the movement like this with this angle, you're going to you're actually activating more muscle fibers. Well, get, you know, guess what? You know, we've already had 300 pound bodybuilders on stage in shape. Those guys got big. For a reason, because they lifted heavy ass weights, okay, with full range motion, okay, using you know good mind muscle connection. There's nothing that's going to replace those exercises. Just like there's no no one's going to come up with a steroid cycle, okay, after they've been out for 60, 70 years now that we didn't think about already back in the day. All the, the there might be new drugs that hit the market, okay, at some time in the future that build muscle that that are that we haven't even conceptualized yet. But of the stuff that's out there, no one's coming up with, with, with a better scheme than what's already out there. That, sorry, they've been around too long. We know what works. Everyone's tried every combination. We know what works, okay? Same thing with exercise. <clears throat> if you want to get big legs, you squat weight. You squat heavy weight with, with, with full range of motion, okay? And you build big legs. If you can't squat because you have an injury and you have to use leg press or Smith machine, that's fine too. But nothing's replacing the squat, okay? None of these extra... So, the bodybuilders know what works to build muscle. Now, if you're a bodybuilder and you're trying to get big legs, that doesn't mean that that's the right exercise to use, okay, if you want to be a sprinter and have great explosive movement. It might be something you incorporate, but there might be, you know, nuances on, on, on the squat and on the leg press that are going to help you with explosive, you know, type movements on stage, I mean, in your event. Um, so, the bodybuilders know what works for the bodybuilders in the gym, drug-wise, given what drugs are out there right now. And we kind of have the food thing figured out pretty well, too. Um, so it, you know, up until recently, they were teaching in school the food pyramid. You know, now they're at least, at least modifying that a little bit uh, to include some, some more uh, open you know, type of ideas about you know, insulin management and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, bodybuilders are still, I think, light years ahead of everyone else when it comes to diet. I talk to people. I do consultations with regular people all the time. They know nothing about diet. They do not teach you this stuff in school. I have no idea why not. It, would, it makes perfect sense to actually have a course on how to eat. I wish they would teach kids how to eat. I wish they would have like a realistic, hey, guys, this is, what, this is protein, this is fat, this is carbohydrates. This is what these things do. If you want to achieve this, you eat this. If you want to achieve that, you eat that. If you want to be healthy and keep your cholesterol low, you have to eat lower carbohydrate and sugared foods. If you want to you know, lose body fat, you've got to keep your carbohydrates lower to keep insulin levels lower. If you want to you know, have, um, whatever, if you want to put extra muscle on, you need extra protein in your diet because that's what builds muscle. They don't teach you that in school. I don't know why. Maybe one day they will. I'll take one more. I know you have Lee Priest coming up in just a matter of minutes. Um, interesting one here is from Chester Brown. So he goes, you know, as men's physique competitors wear board shorts to hide the parts that are not being judged. And then I guess he facetiously asks, how long do you think it'll be until the open men's are wearing football socks up to their knees? So if you want to clarify as far as calves, any bearing on judging, and I know he's kind of joking, but does he have a point? You know, the problem is that you don't really see the, you know, people don't look down that low to see calves. I mean, back in, the, in Arnold's day, I think a guy's legs weren't as big. So calves really stuck out a lot more as being a, a really important body part. But if you have a guy like Rami with enormous, enormous quads, I mean, you almost don't even look past those quads. They're so great. I'm not saying it's a body part that should be neglected, 
But I think it, it's it's less important. Just like, I mean, how many people have lost a show because they had great arms that they didn't have good uh, forearms, you know? You know, you see them, but everyone's looking at the arm up in the air. And if you got a big bicep and tricep, it's, it's very impressive looking. So I, I'm, not, I, I'm more upset about the fact that they don't judge Ben's physique legs than that they, they don't really pay attention to the calves of, of open bodybuilders. Because, I mean, after all, I mean, why not judge men's physique's legs? Why not judge the whole body? I mean... It's, I mean, what is men's physique? It's really a, it's a, it's a, it's a physique contest without posing, essentially. So why not show the whole physique? I don't know. I, I can definitely see over the course of the next, you know, five, ten years, maybe the board shorts getting shorter, maybe them changing that up a little bit. Because I think a lot of those guys in men's physique actually do have good legs. And... Some of them don't want to pose on stage. They don't want to go to classic physique. Now, I, I understand that if you want to show your legs, and you have, you can go to classic. But a lot of these men's physique guys don't want to get as big as the guys in, in classic. And they want to stay in men's physique. So you never know. I, I think we have a, a much better chance of seeing the board shorts get smaller than, uh, <laughs> than them not judging, than them covering up people's calves with the big socks. I don't think that's going to happen. That's going to do for this episode of Ask Dave. A reminder, right now, uh, in the article description below, we have the link uh, to the GoFundMe setup for John Meadows' family. Uh, so, again, whenever we've had situations where bodybuilder or bodybuilder's family has been in need, um, this community has always stepped up, and we expect that you will do the same uh, for John Meadows' family. Um, for anybody that's in the Columbus, Ohio area, uh, we post it on our Instagram uh, the information for John Meadows services which is going to take place um, later this week, uh, I believe Friday. So again, we pass along our warmest wishes to John Meadows family, to his legions of followers um, and do what you can to keep his memory alive because we know that he loved the sport and he loved everyone uh, in this community. For Tyler Shore and Dave Palumbo, I'm Sadiq Farooqui. We'll see you next time.